We brought down three pieces of the Gemara that tell us that a person should wear a kippah in different ways. One says a person should not walk without a kippah. If to go to the one says that a rabbi says, "Oh, I'm so praiseworthy because I never walk four hours without a kippah." And the third story says about a certain boy that was walking without a kippah. And Rabbi Akiva said about him, he said, we know for sure that he's a mamzer and the son of an idah, because he's walking without a kippah, and they checked, and that's what was true. So then we went through the different rishonim, the early sages, who seemed to understand from this gemara, and we see from their language, that the wearing of a kippah is not an obligation, but rather it is, it's an a, it's an extra level of holiness, of piety. The Rambam seems to say like that. The tool seems to say like that. They, they don't think so in Brooklyn. Not in Brooklyn. That's why the Rambam didn't live in Brooklyn. <laughs> if the Rambam lived in Brooklyn, nobody would eat in his house. <laughs> so, uh, then we find suddenly in the Sefer Chassidim, that he seems to say that Velo, you should not walk without four Amma, that means you're not allowed to walk without a keep on your head. And then we come across the Mahari Barona. Now we remember the Mahari Barona. He's the one who reread the Gemarot. So that, which it says, you don't have to wear a kippah, that is speaking about, tell me, uh, a bigger hat. A bigger hat, a second hat that only rabbis wore, Tamanei Chamim wore, or extra holy people wore, or people who wanted to do extra wore. But everybody had a simple hat that they wore on top of their head. And that's what he says. So this is the spin around now. All of a sudden, we find some Rishonim who are of the opinion that wearing a kippah is not as optional as you might think. But rather, rather, it's it's an obligation. What's the optional part of a kippah? Is the extra secondary covering. Thank you. Now, we clarified in the second paragraph here, Oh, what was the reason, by the way, we gave for wearing a kippah from the Talmud? So the person should have? Protection. Fear of heaven. And then protection from sin. And then we find in this Mahari Barona, it's the first piece that he mentions, the reason you must wear a kippah is because... So you don't look like a goyim. So you look different than a goyim. To look different than a goyim. Do you have one of these packets? From yesterday? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So... Some people give it back. So now we're back to the third step. In the third step, we mentioned that everyone agrees, everyone agrees, even those people who say wearing a kippah is only a strong suggestion, or optional, at best, everyone agrees. When you pray... When you pray, when you say Hashem's name, when you make berachot, that you must wear a kippah. So what are they saying, when is the kippah optional? On the street, business. Right, in your normal day-to-day activities. Street, business, walking, sitting. Tof. We're in the third paragraph here in Kuf Lamanchet. It says, Matsinu, Matsinu, you see that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we said that there were three steps to this piece. There's the first step, which is the Rishonim and the Gemara, the early sources. Then there are the Chavonim, the later commentaries, who take apart the early sources. And then there's the third part, the Acharonim will come to the conclusions. So, Rishonim, Acharonim will take apart the Rishonim, and then the Acharonim. Matzinu, we find, Shirabotenu HaAcharonim, the later authorities. Chakru, they researched, Vidiku, and they analyzed, Bidivrei Rabotenu HaRishonim, in the words of our earlier rabbis, Kedei Levarer, in order to clarify, <coughs> Haim, there's in my office if you want. Or I have. You should. Always have one, sorry. Haim halicha, begilui harosh, if walking with an uncovered head, zasur min hadin, this is halachically prohibited. Oh, or, shechiyuv, that the obligation of hakisui, zerak mi pnei midat chasidut, is only because of. An extra level of piety. So we have two choices. Extra, uh, actual halakha, that's called in Hebrew, 
Hadin. What do we call that? Hadin. Mikar Hadin. From the main, the basic law is as such. What's the word for extra level of piety? Midat Chasidut. So you're going to hear these words come up a lot. Min Hadin. Midat Chasidut. We have a rabbi here. Known as the Maharam Mi Rottenberg. Do you want to know who he was? I'll tell you, he wasn't, he wasn't um, Iraqi, <laughs> or Turkish, or Moroccan for that matter. We, we went over him once, he was like a very big Pasuk. He was a very big Pasuk for the Ashkenazim. Mm -hmm. He wasn't a simple person either. A very complicated life story. Unless I'm mistaken, but if I'm not mistaken, this is him. The Maharami Runenberg, I don't want to say it's Varshaker, I don't want to lie. I want to make sure it's the same Maharami Rundenberg I'm speaking about. Give me one second. Oh, yeah, Baruch Hashem. So, the Maharami Rundenberg is known as Rabbi Meir. The Rabbi Meir, the one from the exile. The Maharami Rundenberg was one of the last German Tosafists. I mean, the last authors of the Tosafot. The Maharam was kidnapped by the non-Jewish government in his country and locked up in a large tower, alone, solitary confinement. Right, that's the one. And the Maharami Runenberg was offered back to the Jewish community at a very large ransom. Pay us X amount of money, we'll give you back your rabbi. And as the Jewish story has it, the Maharami Runenberg refused to be ransomed off. Because he said, the moment that you pay the ransom, they're going to do it again. And again. And they're going to do it to other rabbis in different places. And we cannot play into their hands. And the Marami Runenberg passed away in this tower. He lived the rest of his life and died in this tower. <coughs> he wrote many of his books there. Uh, this is the famous Marami Runenberg. So whenever the story comes of giving terrorists back to where they came from, the release of prisoners, this Maharam always comes up. And the question is, was he acting out of a halachic obligation to not be ransomed? Or was he acting out of a level of piety that he refused to set a precedent? The being that there is no halachic tshuva, there's no letter the Maharami Rannenberg actually wrote delineating his reasoning for why he refused to be ransomed. Just the story that we have. So some say that you can't use a story to decide halacha. While others say the story speaks uh, many, many words. And it's important for us to, to take into consideration. And every side has its reasons for the story. So the Maharam Miranenberg, Hamaram Mirotenberg Betshuvotav, in his letters, Katav, he writes in the 65th letter, Beshem Rabbeinu Peretz, in the name of Rabbeinu Peretz, who's one of the giants um, in the times of the Rishonim. Shachilukei Deot, the difference of opinions between the Rishonim, if it's an obligation or a level of piety, Henrak, they're only Bekesher in regards to Lehalicha Stam, just Stam walking, plain walking. Ulam, but, Bizman Tfila, of Bet Knesset, during prayer and in the Bet Knesset, Hakol modim, everyone agrees, sheyesh isur gamur, that there is an actual prohibition, lihiyot beginu rosh, to be with your head uncovered. So it turns out that according to the Maharami Ronenberg, he said that which you see, the Rambam means to say it's a suggestion, or you find the tour says it's a must, they're only arguing in regards to... Down the street. Walking down the street. But when in the Beth Knesset, it's saying, divrei Torah, nobody agrees that you can do such a thing, with the person's head revealed. Harama, the famous Rama, Kotev, he writes, Badarchei Moshe, in his book, Darchei Moshe, Besiman Chet, in the 8th chapter, in the 4th line over there, Shiesh Ledayek, that you should infer, Milashon Hatur, from the language of the Tur, Shebemet, that tr truthfully, and Yisur, there's no prohibition to walk with your head uncovered. <coughs> and therefore, who kotev zot lehalacha, 
He only mentions you have to cover your head in which regard? When does the Torah mention? Do you remember from the previous page? It's the last paragraph on the previous page. Or the second to last paragraph, actually. The second to last paragraph. Hatur. You see the Hatur? Yes. What does the Tour uh, say there? Covering a talit. We use the talit. The first time he tells you you must cover your head is when you're wearing your talit. Why? Because now you're in the Bitzkneset. You're trying to pray. You're doing mitzvot. But the reason the Torah doesn't mention it when you wake up in the morning, why doesn't he mention it there? Because he doesn't believe it to be obligatory. Only an extra level of piety. And therefore, V'lechem who kotev zot, and therefore he only writes this lehalacha for halachic purposes, rak b'shat ha'atifa b'talit, only when one is wearing his talit. That's the first time the tour mentions such a thing. So what is the Ramah's opinion? What does the Ramah say? I just, the Ramah agrees with the tour, or See, the thing is, you could flip the tour around and say he just said it there because of whatever reason. But the Ramah understands that the tour agrees, that the tour is saying you only wear a head covering as obligatory when you're praying or saying brachot. But it's not obligatory when you're walking down the street. That's the Ramah, everybody. Ashkenaz. The great extremist of Ashkenaz. Mm-hmm. Extreme. I'm not saying about him he's an extremist, but everyone seems to say he's so strict. <laughs> but I thought he's referring to a second head, not the kippah. He's referring to? A secondary head, not the... No, that's only according to the Mahari Barona. Oh, oh. But the Mahari Barona, we already said, that's like his own understanding of the sources. That's really his own understanding. So, what? So, Chaim Gavra, not calling the Ramah an extremist, rather, those people who adhere to the words of the Ramah like it's, you know, this is it, so then they should be careful. I mean, they should understand that this is what the Ramah's take on Kippah is. And the next time you see someone without a Kippah, you should be quiet. Yeah. They accept the two sinks and the two fridges, so. That, Which the Ramah didn't have, but, but right, they should, they should at least let people walk without a Kippah, right? It should balance out somewhere, you know, they say. The Sfaradim were so, we do so many things during the year, that's why we have to say 40 days of Slichot, right? It has to balance it out, yeah? <laughs> Ashkenazim don't wake up, so God punishes them, He gives them no rice for Pesach, right? So everyone has their balance, right? It's like a, it's, it's a yin-yang, and the same thing would be here. There's never going to be a class, don't worry, yeah? That's <laughs> okay. So, the Ramah here is saying that it's an only optional, and you have a, oh, it's only optional. We're here. It's on the front. Oh, this is the front page. Here. It's only optional outside of Tila. Okay? Gam Bal Prisha, also the author of the Prisha. The Prisha is a very famous book. He wrote two books. One's called the Prisha, and one's called the Drisha. So when you hear people say it's the Prisha and the Drisha. The two commentaries on the tour and the Shulchan Aruch. Um, some interesting halachot in this. You know, we hold that ladies have to make a bracha and Shabbat candles when? Before. Before yeah. they light the yeah. candles. Before they light the candles. Whereas the prevalent minhag in the world is to do it afterwards. Even <laughs> even in Sephardic community. Which is Shalok Yilzon Chachamim. Which is not the way that the rabbis wanted them to light candles. And the Prisha and the Drisha writes that his... If I'm not mistaken, Imi Harabanit or Ishti, I don't remember if it's his wife or his mother, but I believe it's his mother. It says, My mother, the Rabbanit, she sat down and said that a lady should make a bracha before she lights the candles, like the Shulchan Aruch, and not like the custom that's mentioned in the Ramah. And that shook up the world of Ashkenaz. For two reasons. The first being that that's changing a minhag, of we make a bracha afterwards, not me, then. And that someone's quoting his mother in a halachic book. To which the Magen Avraham, who is the predominant Ashkenazi authority on the Shulchan Aruch, writes, even though her logic is sound, we don't follow her. Sorry. He writes, Ein chokhma benashim. Because there's no wisdom among women. 
And therefore the ladies who light candles and then make the bracha are in essence following the halachot of the Magen Avraham who believe that ladies have no wisdom. But for those of you who would like to then now adapt Maran's custom, Maran says you should make a bracha first. In which case you're following the mother of the Derisha and the Prisha. In which case you're giving klach to the Psak Halacha of his mother. So that's what I always tell ladies. Depends who you want to follow Halacha like. So, the Prisha, a brilliant Hamid Chacham. Gam Baal HaPrisha, also the author of the Prisha. Masbir, he explains, She'ein Isur Badavar, there's no prohibition of walking outside without a kippah. Vahatur Bemet Hitkaven, and the tour really means, Sherak B'Sha'ash Mevarech, only the time when he's blessing Al Atifat HaTalit, on the wearing of the Talit, Tzarich Lachasot Rosho, he must cover his head. So, with the talit, or have your head covered when you say the bracha yeah. on the talit? It's an interesting question, because that already goes to, so how do you do it so that you haven't already put on the talit and now you need right. to make a bracha? It could be that he's saying you have to put something else on, or it could be there's a way to hold the talit while dropping a little bit of it on your head, so you're making a bracha without your head revealed. Wait, don't you make the bracha when you like, do the whole like, lippy thing? <laughs> no, by then it's too late to make a bracha. Oh. But I know, I see people do that all the time. I see it too all the time. That's a mistake. So I thought they make the bracha when they go. The if you throw the tzitzit around, that's what I've seen around. What? When you're putting the talit gadol. Yeah. And then like, when they're already wrapped in it and throwing the talit over their shoulder. The Rambam didn't remember. On the other hand, Rav Soloveitchik writes that you have a mitzvah to make a bracha before you do the mitzvah. He says, but not before before you do the mitzvah. What does that mean? He said he saw some people that while they're unwrapping their talit, they're, they're saying the bracha. Then it's also not the right time. Rather, unravel it, hold it in the right place, make the bracha, and then wrap yourself in it. It has to be at the right time. And so, you had a question? Or you... Well, I, I was just, you said that the Ramban had said that when you're in Chile, you have to wear a kippah. If you're praying at home, that's like being in shul, right? Right, so he was saying two things. When you're in shul and when you're praying. Oh, and it, it's there, right. Meaning, you could be sitting in shul and not praying, you'd have to wear a kippah. Or it could be praying at home, and you're not in the shul, you'd still have to wear a kippah. That's, that's a that's good question. True. But when he says tefillah and bet knesset, it's not together, but rather either or. So, essentially, these are both understanding the tour. The tour to say that one does not have to wear a kippah necessarily. Let's keep going. Besiman bet, but in the second section of Shulchan Aruch, Kotev Hatur, the Tur writes, Vezel Shonon, this is the exact language. Vayakom, you should get up. Vayelech, and you should walk Bekfifut Koma, with a bent over back. Again, Kfifut Koma is the opposite of the upright, meaning he's not telling you to have bad posture, rather he's telling you modest. I mean, be modest when you are walking around. Kedita, like it's written Beperek Kama de Kiddushin in the first chapter of Kiddushin. Amar Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi says Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi Asur lelech bekomas kufa It's forbidden to walk with an arrogant posture, an upright back. Shneemar, like it says Melo Kol ha'aretz kevodo. The whole world is filled with his honor. Why does that mean that you can't be arrogant? Because he's greater than you. Right, because Hashem is greater than you. So you have nothing to be so proud about. V'chaser rosho, and then you should cover your head. Did you just hear what happened? No, what did the Torah tell you? You don't have to. Vayakom, get up. Vayelech, and you should walk with the food come out with a, you know, a humble posture. And then, v'chaser rosho, and then you should cover your head. Kedita nami hatam, like it also says over there in Kiddushin, Rav Huna lo azil arba amot, Rav Huna did not walk four amot, begilu harosh with a revealed head. Amar, and he said, the reason for this, shechina lemala meroshi, the shechina is above my head. Now you have to see something beautiful. You have a rabbi known as the Bach. The Bach is not a famous musician. 
Rather, he is a famous rabbi. <laughs> the Bach, I mentioned him in my book, in the laws of Yashan Chadash, if you read that chapter. The Bach was one of the giants of Ashkenaz, specifically of the Hasidic movement. He was one of the great-great-grandfathers of Rav Shlomo Karabach, hmm. believe it or not. Uh, Rav Shlomo mentions him a lot as my Zaydi, but he's not directly his Zaydi, but one of his ancestors. The Bach, you have the tour in the middle of the page, the Bet Yosef on the side of the page, the Rabbi Yosef Cairo, and the Bach on the left hand side of the page, or right hand, depending on the editions or what page you're on, those kind of things. Habach, the Bach Medayek, he infers Milashon Hatur from the language of the tour. Shekevan Shehu Kotev, that because he writes, Vayakom Vayelech, you should get up and walk. Kodem first, and only afterwards, Katav, he says, you should cover your head. Because of the sequence of the Torah's writings, the Torah is coming to tell you, you don't have to worry at all about having a revealed head when you're sitting down. Rather, the only time you have to be worried is when you are walking. But when you are sitting down, you don't have to. Right, so you hmm. go to shul, you cover your head for it to feel up, you walk out, you keep your head covered, you sit down, take your hat off, then you get up and put it back on again. Well, here the Bach is saying something else. <laughs> That's almost I'm, like I'm middle not, America. I'm or not trying to be... No, you're right, you're right. <laughs> cynical. You're, well, no, what you're doing now is you're combining two different opinions. You're combining the, the Prisha and the Ramah together with the Bach. The Bach says, hey, this is my own paragraph over here on Kufal HaMechet. I have my own paragraph, it's my time to glow. I'm not dealing with what they wrote before me. I'm telling you that when I look at the tour, it tells me something. It tells me you don't have to cover your head sitting when you are sta- sitting, only when you are walking. At all times? Well, let's see. V'chen katav l'dayek, and he also wrote that one should infer, Mishem Misham, from over there, Shatur Nakat Lashon Zeh, the tour chose this language, Kedei Lomar, to teach you, Shebesha'a, that the time Shorotzeh Lelech, when you want to walk, Yichaseh Roshot Chila, you should cover his head first. First, before walking. Before walking. Kedei, in order, Shelo Yeh Nichshal, that he should not stumble, Behalichat Arba Amot, and walking four Amot, Begilu Harosh, with the revealed head. The Bach just did a 180 degree turn on us over here. So much hope. The Bach just said, no, no, no. So you guys are not reading the tour properly. The tour here is saying, you get up and walk and cover your head, meaning cover your head when you walk. Meaning when you walk, you have to wear a head covering. I don't agree with you, Rama, in the Prisha. I don't agree with you that the tour is telling you, you don't have to cover your head when you walk. Rather, he is telling you, no, you have to cover your head when you walk. And this is a classic example of two different Acharonim picking apart the same Rishon and coming apart with two different conclusions based on the same thing that someone wrote in a book. Which is why sometimes I'll tell you, it says in the Shulchan Aruch X. And someone else says, oh, it says the Shulchan Aruch Y. Because there's two different ways to read the Shulchan Aruch. And both of us are lying to you. Both of us are telling you there's only one way to read it. We're telling you there's only one way to read it according to us. According to you, there could be a different way. No one's denying there's another way. So what do you do when you have two different opinions that are reading the same source differently? Cover your head all the time. <laughs> you, just, you, you just take the safe road. You cover it partially. Oh, you just said three different things. Yeah. You cover your head all the time. You find a third authority. Or, or you can cover someone else's head. We cover None of you said the third answer. <laughs> cover when you're sitting down. That's like what Simcha said. Don't cover when you're sitting down. But just cover when you're walking. Cover when you're in Beit Knesset, but you don't have to cover when you're walking or sitting down. Well, that's a question. According to the Bach, what if you're sitting in a Beit Knesset? Do you have to cover your head? Uh, he doesn't no. say. In a Beit Knesset. Well, he, he hasn't well, he he picked it apart. They said there's a roof, right? There. But there's a question then. He doesn't cover it. Because on one hand, he's saying when you sit, you don't have to. But maybe he agrees with the Ramah that when you're sitting in a shul, you have to. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. 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 
Okay. So so they're always you do Shmon you gotta have a key they're all, you're sitting down to There are always Shema, three don't. ways to deal with the problem in halakha. <laughs> the difference of opinion. Do you, do you know the reason why most people don't teach halakhot in depth? They don't get stuck. Because they get confused. People get confused, that's true. Most people don't know what to do when they're met with five different Jewish opinions that tell them something. Well, that's why we have right. a lawyer's mentality. Like, uh, <laughs> our friend was saying, well, let's do everything we possibly oh, can so to we're, make we're, sure I'm we gonna don't do, I'm going to get to yeah. this. I mean, we, we as a whole, we've been studying for months and months already. And we went through Jewish history. We went through the times of the Rishonim, the Chaonim, the Tanaim, the Moraim, the Shulchan Aruch. The, but we went through all those things. But someone who doesn't have that whole basis is going to walk into the argument like this and he feels like he's in the Wild West between two people pointing at guns at each other. He doesn't know what he's supposed to do. He knows that whichever way he goes, he's going to get shot in the middle. <laughs> and that's very daunting. And we even got the And unfortunately, <laughs> there are many people who don't know how to teach halakha in a way that doesn't confuse people, because in essence, halakha is very confusing. See, when you teach someone Gemara and you have Hillel and Shammai arguing with each other, the practical ramifications on your life are zero to none. Because what difference does it make? If Hillel holds the ox and the, the cow and they gore the other one. But here you're dealing with, do I have to wear a kippah when I walk out of this class or not? I'm dealing with such a situation. So what do you do when you're met with two people who argue and we understand both of their logic from the source that they're reading? You have three choices. You have what we call the name game. That's what Simcha was saying. But let's wait till we get to the name game. You have what you mentioned. What you mentioned is standard Orthodox Judaism. Yeah. The way is, two people who argue, three people who argue, let's just make everyone happy. Let's always wear a kippah. Let's wear a kippah when we're praying. Let's wear a kippah when we're walking. Let's wear a kippah when we're sitting. Let's wear a kippah when we're, doing, when we're eating. Let's wear a kippah when we're doing everything. That way we never come into the problem of deciding between the two. But you lose nuance and you lose the level of priority of when it's most the mitzvah to do something or not. Oh, absolutely. It absolutely. kind of flatlined. In a sense. Because so now what you've done is you've point. really not satisfied anybody. Dumb you've just a, yeah. created a third opinion. Just cover yourself. Just cover yourself. Covering me. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. No, he's good with puns. Yes, so this, this situation is problematic. And you find that most Orthodox rabbis today it's not, a, it's not a bad thing necessarily. But their approach to halachot is, oh, let's just make everyone happy. The problem is, there's only a limit to how long this can last. It's already starting. Before, in the process of making everyone happy, you are reaching levels of extremism and, and, and carefulness which you have never found before in the Jewish people. And that can be a turnoff for people. That gets people to run away, like from a wildfire. That gets people to do all kinds of... of that, that gets people to not want to learn Torah anymore. That also, that also causes people to feed into this certain extreme drive, which is inside of them. And once you let that loose, that halakha, you decide that you want to do everything. Right. So then people do that with everything in their life. And they're not built for doing such things. That's a, there's a process you have to go through to reach a level where you're following everyone's opinion. And it's very dangerous. Yes. And it's perhaps one of the biggest problems... With well, not just the Bali Truva world, because it's already fed into our whole world. This is perhaps one of the biggest problems that people find with traditional Judaism today. And I know they tell you at all the conventions the biggest problem facing Judaism today it's intermarriage and it's assimilation and it's it's the, the Goyesh news radio and it's whatever else they're telling you on the Internet. and I'm telling you. But what we're doing here should be required of every Jew who wants to get into Judaism, because basically what people get is like. Like a prepackaged, okay, you can go this way, and this is how we do it. Or you can go this branded, way, this is how we do it. Judaism. Or you go here, and this is how you do it. And why? But this is what we do. And therefore, if you get there, you're, you're stuck there. You don't really know why you're doing it or why other Jews do it differently. They can't last so long. No. Yeah, I said this, I don't know if I mentioned Sorry, here. Right. No, the reason why we learn the, the short books, do this, don't do that, is because we have to cover ground on our own, to have our own life. But that doesn't, that's only a temporary solution. We have to then spend the rest of the time filling in the blanks. And that's what we're doing here, Baruch Hashem, but there's a whole world out there that needs to do it. And yeah, then you have the second solution. So there's a solution to make everyone happy, really invent a third opinion. Yeah, I call it the gospel solution. Why? 
Can I tell you why? Or the angled mezuzah. Because there's four, <laughs> there's four different Gospels about Yeshu. No, I'm bringing it into the halakha class. And each one of them says completely different things about Yeshu's life. Where he was born, how he was born, where he died, how he died, why he died, no, where who his father was, so on and so forth. Yeah. And the question is, so which of the Gospels are right? No. And the Catholic Church issued a letter, issued a letter in the 80s, the 80s or the 90s, and their decision was, if you believe in all of them, you are in essence creating a fifth gospel. A transcendent gospel. In which case, I said, you know, good for you guys. Thank God I don't have to deal with your problem. Yeah? Your problem, figure it out. Go ask the rough. Yeah? But, but we sometimes have this situation where we follow all four opinions, so to speak, and we create the fifth gospel. So that's gospel, number one. Then you have the name game. The name game is, we have a rule in the Torah. You have two verses that contradict each other. So we say before we, we pray, and, which means you wait until the third verse comes and says, oh, I side with verse number one or verse number two. In which case, what does that tell you? That, that the majority rule, that's who you follow. This name game is played very often. And that is, I got a phone call, for example, from my brother-in-law in Israel. Big time and he was bothered by the fact that in my book, I didn't just say that the custom is not to keep Motzei Shabbat like Rabbeinu Tam, that we don't wait an extra 72 minutes on Saturday night. He said, it was okay if you just wrote that it's not the custom. He said, but you had the audacity to write that it's a bad thing to wait that custom. He said, who are you basing yourself on? He said, there are this rabbi and that rabbi and the third rabbi and the fourth rabbi and they all say not like that. I said, well, do you keep remaining time? He said, no. <laughs> and so what's bothering you with this? He said, it bothers me that you're saying it's wrong. You should just say, that's not how we do it. There is a majority that disagrees with us, but we have a custom not like that. So I told him, I said, I have a problem with this, this idea, this worldview. He said, see, I had a rabbi. I relied on a few people, not just one person, I had a few people. Uh, my rabbi, Masas, in his letter says, some pretty terrible things about people who keep Rabbeinu Tam. Okay, that's my opinion. You don't have to agree, but that's my opinion. See, so when you name names, you have this rabbi and that rabbi and the third rabbi, so it's, you're right, you are gaining a lot of support. But where do you draw the line? It's majority rules. You know what gets you in the biggest trouble with that rule? It's great when you say, okay, so you have the Shulchan Ruch, you have the Ramah, you have the Rambam, I don't know, throw us a few names in there. You have Rav sure. Moshe Feinstein, you have Rav uh, Ovadi Yosef, you have, and you have like ten rabbis, let's say, so seven of them say X, fine. So we follow the seven. But in all honesty, that's not majority rules. Some say that the rule of majority rules doesn't apply after the Talmud. Because in essence, what everyone else is doing are echoing differences of opinions that already were mentioned in the Talmud. Majority rules are when there's the sages and Hillel. And they're arguing because they're both novel ideas. But when there's 300 rabbis, because they all belong to a movement, they all say X, that's not a majority. That's just 300 people echoing one opinion. There is such an opinion. But I'm not even going there. I don't want to get philosophical now. I want to tell you the practical side. Look at all those red books on the back shelf, the top row. Those are all Rav Ovadi Yosef's books. And Rav Ovadi Yosef did something that, that upset the whole world. A lot of things, but <laughs> one thing. Rav Ovadi Yosef introduced a new style of learning to the Jewish people. And this new style was, I don't care how you did it, I don't care how you used to write it, I don't care what you think. I am not going to be a rabbi who tells you, we do this, or my opinion is to do that. I'm going to ask all the questions that you're thinking. And I'm going to answer all of them and prove why you're wrong. So that when I get to my conclusion, I've already outsmarted you. I've outsourced you. I've outnumbered you with books. You have no choice but to agree with my conclusion. <laughs> See, when you come to Rav Moshe Feinstein, Rav Moshe Feinstein's style and his tshuva is beautiful. He says, I think the answer is like this because I saw the Rambam says this and this Rabbi says that. And, and that's why it is what it is. Rav Ovadi Yosef, in one of his chuvot in the laws of Pesach, it's a simple question about matzah on the first night of Pesach. It's a 45-page answer. And not 45 pages of him talking, 45 sources. pages of sources, about, about one source every line. <laughs> wow. Yeah? 
And so when you finish 45 pages of that, what are you going to do? You're going to argue now? Because you have who? You have the Rambam? Good for you, but that's 45 pages against the Rambam. And Rav Ovanya introduced the style of, he passed away with 40,000 books in his private library. Not the books in his yeshiva and the other places that he would study. 40,000. They counted in the shiva. They had nothing to do. They counted books. Rav Ovanya Yosef, I can testify about him. You don't need my testimony, but knew every one of those books by heart. It's something that people don't understand. For one thing, people didn't like him, they didn't argue with him, but they could not understand how one person knew so much. I was in Rav Avadi's house. He would tell you, go to that shelf and bring that book, and not just what pages, he would know where Nine. on the shelf the book was. He would tell his son, Rav Yaakov, so go get me, it's on the second shelf from the top, three books in, the brown one. Yeah, that's what you should get. He every book in his library. And when he would write his books, he would be quoting in like, you know, this page, that page, this line. That, not just when it came to halachic literature. Now I have a book of it. It says, the Chavetz Chaim biography, this printing house edition on page 35 towards the top. You know what, it's a biography of the Chavetz Chaim. It's not, a, it's not the Shulchan Aruch over here. But that was his style of learning. Rav Ovadi Yosef had access to books that other people didn't have. And did you know that there was a famous rabbi? And his name was the Pri Ha'adama? Mm, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he was one of the Sephardic chief rabbis of Israel about three hundred years ago. And Rav Avadi likes a lot of his books, but suddenly you know, you're arguing with somebody, and he throws um, Pre- from the rabbi. He throws a you know the pre Adama says what is it? What is his bore? Like what does he say? Yeah, right? Bore what, what does he say? Rav Avadi himself introduced names that you've never met before, and now comes the question: So you have a solid argument? It's logical, and you've sourced it in two, three, four, five sources. But someone else comes with 300 sources that disagree with you. Do you have to give up your source now? You have to give up your halachic decision? But you have to understand the majority is against you. Is it really that the majority is against you? Who's the majority? How does that work? Which names out trump which names? For example, I have 20 people from today. possible work for the five that you have the other. Exactly. You can't. It's very hard to know that. It sounds like uh, Rabbi Avadi Yosef invented hypertext in a way in his mind. He could touch a place and refer it to something uh, else. By the way, people, it's this one of the most amazing things about him. He introduced a new style of literature. Literature was it a few sources is not enough. You have yeah. to bring everything. So much so, in Baltimore, when I was in yeshiva, I'm going to talk to you about it after class. When I was in yeshiva, uh, one of my rabbis had all of Rabbi Avadi Yosef's books in his house. I said, Rabbi, you are not Sephardic by a long shot. He told me, he said, I don't use it to paskin halachas from. I use it as a reference book. I said, why? He said, my rule of thumb is if Rabbi Vadi Yosef doesn't quote it, it's because it doesn't exist. And if I go through his sources and don't find something in there, I don't have to look because I'm not going to find it. <laughs> I'm not going to find it. Yeah. Didn't you tell us long time ago that the Rina Gaon also had that technique? Yes. Had yes. Had Though it's arguable if the Vilna Gaon it's arguable that Vilna Gaon had as much access to as many books as one does today. Not because the Vilna Gaon was less intelligent, <coughs> because the, the world was such that you, you had limited access to books. There wasn't uh, you know, mass printing. and it was, Sometimes you read, like in the writings of the Chida, I was always looking for this book, and I found one copy in the house of some man when I was traveling through Europe. Like that, that's, the, that's how you found books. So... Yeah, exponential growth. How do you deal with problems? So then you have this solution, which is the numbers game. You just bring a lot of sources to prove your point. <laughs> so we have now the Bach is arguing with the Rema and the Prisha, that's two against one. And if we find someone who agrees with the Bach, then what do we have? Two against two. Two, two against two, that's a tie. Mm-hmm. If we find three that agree with the Rema and the Prisha, then we're going to outrule the Bach and he's gone. Throw him off the page. Then you have the third style. The third style has a clause A and a clause B to it. The third style says, there's nothing intelligent about following all the opinions. You're not really following it's like, what bracha do you make on a chocolate-covered raisin? So they tell you, you should make a ha'etz on an apple, a shakol in a glass of water, and then you don't have to worry about, do you make a bracha on the chocolate or the raisin? Because you just took away the two brachot and you're good to go. Did you answer my question? That's the lawyer's intent. Did you answer my question? No. No, you didn't tell me what bracha do I make in the chocolate-covered raisin. You gave me a solution as to how to not get myself involved. And by the way, you know that trick doesn't really work. There are post I don't want to confuse you. 
They're posting to say the bracha on chocolate is? Adama? Hi, it's. Hi, it's because from a cook. Oh, the I assume that it's real chocolate, not like uh, today's. Right. But it's like, also ground up into a different So form. according to the Shulchan Aruch, the ground up in a different form doesn't change its bracha. I mean, the Maran says if you're eating applesauce and it's smushed and it's smushed and it doesn't look like an apple, but it's just applesauce, well, you or the majority of applesauce, you, know you would still make a ha'itz on the applesauce. So, Whereas the Ashkenazim follow actually the Svardik poskim who say, no, we will make a shackle on this, because it's mushed up and it's changed its form. Yeah. So today, everybody makes a shackle on apple, but except for myself and a few other people, uh, it's like my life. What if it has chunks of apple? Then it's already, then you hear the chunky apple sauce, not chunky apple sauce. The one that looks like apple doesn't... So there are Ashkenazim who won't eat rice unless they eat it with bread. That's only Chabad. Chabad doesn't? It's, a, it's an invention of Chabad. Why? Why would they even say that? We can talk, because there's a Gemara. There's a Gemara that says that rice could be hamotzi. Oh, I read and even though nobody follows such an opinion, the Maran doesn't say, and so the Lubavitch Rebbe said that those who are careful with themselves should make sure to only eat rice as part of a meal. We don't have such an opinion in, yeah. in Halachot, but it's, oh, yeah, it's the, the Lubavitch it's custom, they can do it. Like, so back to our topic. Rice and peso. So you would follow then, it's not a brilliant thing to, to decide, I'm going to follow everyone. This approach was not accepted by many schools of thought. Especially, especially in the Sephardic camp, but not necessarily. There were Ashkenazim who didn't buy into the accept everyone's approach either. <laughs> though, though, the question is so, if I don't follow everybody, then who do I follow? You're back to the question. I have an argument between the Bach and the Ramah. I have an argument between the Lubavitch Rebbe and Ramosha Feinstein and Ramavadi Yosef. Those are three big guns. Who are you going to follow? Are you crazy to stick your head in the middle? <laughs> Just follow everybody. That's the safest approach. But it's not the most halakhically accurate approach. And the Chida, not the Chida, the Chazonish. Who's the Chazonish? Baghdad. Nope, not, he's not in Baghdad. Wait, That's sorry, the Benishkai. Bnei Brak. He's Bnei Brak. Bnei Brak, very nice. He is the Rosh Yeshiva, not of anywhere. He is the rabbi in Bnei Brak. He was one of the giants of Ashkenaz. Now, in our last generation. Rav Avram Mishael Karlitz. The Chazonish writes, I wish I had his language in front of me. He says, Hasechem. Your mind, your logic. Hu Hamalach is the angel, the messenger. Bein Hayotzer Levein Hayetzu. Between the creator and the creation. I mean, the way to reach Hashem as a creation is to use your brain. He says, and even though we are Mishubadim le Piske Shulchanauch, says, even though we have an obligation to be bent over to the rules of the, so we submit to the Shulchanauch's opinion. This is when we decide Halachot. Between two halakhically sound opinions, we must follow the one which sits the most well with our logic. Does it fit into the understanding of the Talmud? Does it fit into the sources which, which preceded him? Does it fit into how I view these things to mean? If so, and you have a valid source, you are now obligated to follow this opinion of halakha over the other one. There is no name game. There is no majority rules, and there's no making up a third opinion. Was he influenced by the Rambam? He, the Rambam was very into logic, philosophical... Well, a lot of people were. I don't know I don't know if I would say influenced by the Rambam. That's unusual under, for Ashkenaz and Paskin, no? In, in his generation. Before that, no. Before that, no. But this approach... I mean, Efuch and Ashkenaz, it wasn't done out of running away from problems. It, it's not the reason why I they know, did it. Rav Soloveitchik has a piece where he says the reason they did it... He says it was a midat chasidut. It was an extra level of piety. Like... I know that I'm allowed to eat it, but if the Rambam says I should and someone else says I shouldn't, I'd rather just avoid, I don't want to put my head in between the Rambam and, and, and uh, the Rashba. Why should I do it? It was an extra level of piety. I mean, abstaining from things that I don't have to eat or don't have to do. Or don't. So in this situation, we're always covering our head. According to the Chazon Ish, though, you'd have an obligation to sit down and to analyze all of these opinions and to say which one fits into the sources more. The Bach is looking at the tour. And the Bach says, I see the tour saying two things. When you sit down, you don't need to wear a kippah. And I see the tour saying that when you walk, you must wear a kippah. But the Ramah, on the other hand, says, But don't you see the tour? The tour only says you have to cover your head in, in necessary terms when you are putting on your talit. But in the morning, he just uses this term of. You shouldn't walk. 
referring to people who really are, are pious or, or extra kashas, but not to everybody. Well, walking doesn't mean standing upright. It means walking sort of on. So who are you? Who are you talking to now? Which which opinion? What? Who are you commenting on? Which opinion? Well, I don't. I, I'm trying to follow everything you've said. It's a it's a jumble of names, but oh. <laughs> but um, can I pause you for a second? I suggest when you reach a name that we quote, underline it. That's right. That when you or put it in a box. I used to put it in boxes. That when you look at the page, you suddenly see Rambam, Rashi, Shulchan Aruch, and you now see where they are on the page. Isn't it also well, he's, he's the middle of the No, so where are we now? Where, where, where so we have two opinions. Yeah. The Bach's understanding of the tour, yeah. which is that when you sit down, you don't have to wear a kippah, but when you stand up, you do. And and his opinion is that you must wear a kippah when you walk, and that's why he says when you walk, you should put on your kippah. Yeah. The Ramah says no. Clearly he's telling you to walk right. before you're putting on your kippah. And he's only telling you you must wear a kippah when you put on your talit. In my opinion, so far, the Ramah is more accurate here. In his reading of the Shulchan Aruch. Though we don't have any reason to say to the Bach that he's wrong, in regards to... in regards to sitting down. The Ramah doesn't say when you sit down you have to wear a kippah. So it could be that we'll do something classic here. Say, Bach, we disagree with you, when it comes to walking, there being a necessity to wear a kippah. But we do agree with you, so far, in regards to sitting down, that maybe you don't have to wear a kippah. It could be the Ramah even agrees with you. It could be even that everyone else agrees with you. No one yet has mentioned sitting down, right? Oh. Is it the f- I'm going to throw another wrench, and maybe it's not, maybe I'm just being foolish, but is it to find what separates what a pious person does from a normal Jew? Explain. In other words, the pious cover their heads all the time, but those who are not the quote-unquote the pious don't cover their head when they walk. How do you determine who should be the pious one and not the pious oh, one? Oh, very nice. Is that, this is not a wrench, it's just a question. The question is, just makes if sense. pious people cover their head, and people who are not extra pious don't cover their head, <coughs> so enough, do you look down upon a person who's not being extra pious? The answer is no. Can't. Because the same term is used that, you know, wearing a second pair of tefillin is a midat chasir. You don't look down on somebody who doesn't wear two pairs of tefillin. Yeah. Sometimes you even look down on somebody who wears two, because yeah. he's not there yet, right? Sometimes you would do such a thing. But, when it comes to extra level of piety, you're having two categories in here. We have the people who must do it, rabbis, Torah scholars, and then perhaps you have people that can do it, if they want to, but you can't force them to do it. You can make someone put a kippah on when they're in synagogue. You cannot make someone put a kippah on when they're sitting on your couch. According to that opinion. So in essence, you if it was a level of piety, then you have to let someone do what he wants. But if it's not a level of piety, it's a, it's a mandatory must, then it's like everything else in Judaism that you must do. Yeah. When you're sitting down, if you're eating, what happens? So you notice we haven't mentioned eating yet? Yeah. <laughs> it seems to be the only problem with eating without a kippah would be as simple as you just said it. Making the bracha. Making the, we'd have to like, like Zev was suggesting before, put it on, take it off. <laughs> uh, put it on, to, oh, sorry, I want to say it's right now. <laughs> put your, so probably just, it became, we say you have to wear a kippah when you eat. That's not so accurate. You have to make, wear a kippah when you make a bracha. Uh, hopefully you're making a bracha before you eat, and that's why we're telling you when you eat, yeah. you should wear a kippah. <laughs> So there anything about while you eat to wear a kippah? Well, sitting? not where we've reached now. Yeah. Not where we've reached now. <laughs> well, I know we're not done. That's very clear. So, I, you know, I have a basic question. You are talking sure. about that we have a right to make a decision by looking at the logic of how we come to the final decision. But we're also told that we should ask our local rabbi about any question we have about halakha, and we just should take that opinion and accept it. I, I agree with you on the first part, and the first part of the second part. But not the second part of the second part. <laughs> we should not accept it without getting a reason. Oh, here you go. Okay. Yes. 
Just like when you want an opinion about medicine, when you have an opinion about medicine, you go ask a doctor. And when you need to know something about law, you ask a lawyer. So then, you would do the same thing. You have a question about halakha, you ask a posik, not a rabbi. Not every rabbi is a posik. Not every rabbi is knowledgeable in areas of halakha. You have to know that. Some rabbis just have beards. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to know, some, some don't even have that, right? But you have to know, you have to know who you're going to ask. But assuming that you're talking about rabbis who are competent in areas of halakha, yeah. So when it comes to, to halakhot, you have to ask your rabbi questions in halakha. You don't, when I say use your judgment, I'm talking to people who are studiers of halakha, but not those who aren't. The question now is as follows. You are pretty much a Tamit Chacham now, in the first and almost entire second chapters of the Shulchan Aruch. So when it comes to matters of Siman Aleph and Siman Bet of the Shulchan Aruch, you can ask yourself the question. You can decide for yourself these questions. If you had something that was a little bit beyond your pay grade, uh, that we didn't learn, that we didn't study, so that's when you would ask somebody who's an authority. The reason being, imagine if you had a medical thing you were researching, and you know a lot about medicine. You dabble a lot in medicine. You're not a doctor. You're not a medical professional. Uh, but you're you're aware of medicine. So you wouldn't ask the doctor every question that came to mind. You would look it up yourself. But the second it comes to actually making real decisions that are, are big, you wouldn't trust yourself. You'd say, even though I know a lot about this topic, I'm going to go to a rabbi. Now then the question is, when you ask a rabbi, are you... Are you obligated to follow what it is that he tells you. Yeah. It's true and it's not true. It's true if the rabbi is your rabbi. It's not true if it's just a rabbi. You have an obligation to follow your rabbi, whether you like it or not. And but that is without, you don't have to ask a question about how he came to that decision. You, you have to question him, respectfully. You're not allowed to do something that your rabbi tells you to do, that you find wrong or incorrect. If it's just something you don't know much about, so you, okay, I believe him, you don't, you don't have to make him explain to you his entire logic. There are actually times where Rabbi is not allowed to tell you all of his logic, in the fear that you'll use that logic to then, to then make mistaken decisions. This happens like this famous story about the lady who came to ask a rabbi, she had some milk fall into her chicken soup. And uh, she went call the rabbi, the rabbi explained, he said, it's okay, said, well, how can it be okay, I have milk in my chicken soup. So oh, there's a halakha, as long as there's 60 times the amount of milk, so on and so forth. Right. My mother always tells the story. So after a few months, the rabbi didn't hear from the lady. He saw her in the marketplace. And so how's, how's everything going? No more problems? Rabbi, ever since you gave me the new recipe, it's the best chicken soup we have all week long. <laughs> that rabbi would have been better off not explaining to her the reason, rather just telling her, in this situation, in this situation, uh, it's okay. You know, we do this the same thing with, with Tairat Mishpacha, when people ask questions. If the person is coming to learn, they need to know because they don't want to keep coming back. So there are obvious things to say, this is okay, this is not okay. This you should ask a question about. Sometimes the person who's asking, we don't trust them to, to make their own decisions. And then you just say, yes, no, come back to me next time, come back to me next time. It's like every other field. You have to know how much information you're willing to let out. You're obligated, though, to listen to your rabbi. I don't call up other people to ask questions when I have halakha questions. Aside from my Rebbe. Because it doesn't help me that someone else says X and my Rebbe doesn't agree with that. So I call up my Rabbi. When someone comes to ask me a question, and they, I know they, they always ask me halakha questions, I tell them exactly what it is that I think they should be doing. But if they come from a different community or they're visiting us from out of town, I always tell them either to wait and ask their Rabbi, or if it's a pressing matter, I tell them, your Rabbi would probably say, and I tell them what it is. Even though that's not my opinion. But I have to tell them what it is that they should be doing so that when they go back home, they don't get in trouble. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that answers your question. But you are allowed to make halakhi decisions on things you are aware about, not things that you are not knowledgeable of. That's pretty much the bottom line. So, we have ten minutes now. We're going to con- clearly continue this article into next week. I think it more than just understanding the topic of kippah, it gives us a little bit of an understanding of the entire halachic system. Process. More than just the Shulchan Aruch and its commentaries, but a little bit of, wow, so we've just taken the bigger picture. Not because I wrote it, don't worry, because it's, it's, a, it's a piece that, it's not a topic, let's say, controversial. It's a topic that we all deal with every day, 
It's not something that's not no gal, you do this all the time. It's something that's relevant and important, and we should go through all the, the sources and, and the logic behind it. Yes? We discussed the size and the oh. color. Oh. <laughs> so color, color I can't help you with. Size, Jack has a great article that he emailed me. Uh, maybe you can ask, if anyone wants to read the article, give him your email address and he'll be happy to forward it to you. It's a special article from Rabbi Nair, but the size of a kippah. 